Thanks, thanks, Tom. Well, before we uh, get started, uh, let's see, what are our announcements for the day? So your first homework is due to, uh, not tomorrow, Friday. The extension, for those of you who sent the grumpy notes, this is an extension, it's not an early due date. I just misspoke in class and I'm being a nice guy. <laughs> I just wanted to communicate how nice I am to all of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of groans here. Uh, yeah, but anyway, sending your professor unhappy emails is not always the best way to communicate your feelings. Um, but that aside, uh, you know, you guys do have two extra days. Um, I'll hold some extra hour, uh, office hours. For, uh, there were some people that emailed and said, I'm unhappy that you extended the deadline to Friday because I like to procrastinate. That's puzzling to me. Um, <laughs> I will hold extra office hours because I'm a nice guy, but they'll be later on Wednesday because my schedule is just booked the rest of the week. So my suggestion would be, you know, like, don't procrastinate. Um, but you know that, like, the office hours are intended to help you guys out, and there are many students who just show up and do their homework in the office hours. Like, they don't have a question, they're just hanging out, and that's fine. Okay. Uh, the reality is that, like, we're pretty nice, and when you, get, when you run into, like, a stumbling point, we'll just help you right there. Um, which is preferable for everybody than like this weird, awkward piazza exchange, which is no fun at all. And, you know, you'll, you'll just get like a two-word response from me because it's usually written while I'm on the tee. So anyway, that's uh, the next one. And then after that, your assignments really are in the two-week intervals. So my apologies for misspeaking before. Uh, and after this, we're on a pretty regular schedule. Uh, are there any questions about our uh, logistics so far? How many of us have at least downloaded and compiled the assignment? Good, you learned something. Fabulous. Um, yeah, so for those of you who haven't, shame on you. Okay, so today uh, we're going to continue uh, talking about different places where linear algebra shows up in computer graphics. This, I think, is the more famous uh, example, which is to talk about coordinates and transformations. Um, or really, what this is, is just bookkeeping for computer graphics. So uh, we're going to see that, like, essentially all the concepts here are pretty straightforward, but it's easy to get it wrong. And you'll discover that on your homework too. We're going to implement a lot of what we discussed today and what we discussed in our next lecture on, on skinning. And we'll see that like conceptually this stuff is super straightforward, right? Like I'm just keeping track of like where my camera is and where objects are in the scene and all that good stuff. But it's really easy to like get your matrix multiply like transposed or inverted or on the wrong side and all that kind of stuff. And there are two ways to debug this kind of code. One is to try every combination until it works which I guarantee will not work for your assignment. Actually, I've seen one or two students that have managed to like, enumerate every possibility, but, but don't do that. The better thing to do is to think through it the way that we'll talk about today and, and really be careful about how you do your bookkeeping. So the basic takeaway of our lecture <coughs> today is to talk about hierarchical modeling. And the point is that in the typical 3D and 2D computer graphics world, there's all kinds of coordinate systems involved. Everybody's favorite thing from linear algebra class. There's a position of the camera, the scene, the lights, the drivers, the car, the arm, the hand. And you know what would be a huge pain in the tuchus would be to animate your entire scene by keeping track of the coordinates of everything in terms of like where the camera is. <laughs> right? Because like if a car's driving forward and the camera like scooted over, it wouldn't even look like the car were moving in a straight line. So obviously that's not the right thing to do. And so in this class, what we're going to try and argue is that Really, the right way to do this is hierarchically, right? That maybe the position of the driver is stored relative to the position of the car, the position of the car is stored relative to the position of the road, maybe the camera is also relative to the road, and so on. What that means is that you have this huge set of matrices describing the relationship between every object you're seeing and every, and every other object, and you need to have sort of elegant computational systems for maintaining that without, like, total excruciating pain. Yeah? And that's what we're here to avoid. So, as sort of a philosophical point, in case I, I haven't convinced you that hierarchical modeling is, is, is useful, uh, anytime that you look at a 3D scene, the first question you should ask, you know, as you walk you know, back down the infinite corridor later today, where is the origin? Right? Like, where, where in the scene? Maybe we put it at the bottom of the pile of rocks, but of course, we're playing a big video game, so maybe our pile of rocks is sitting on our Windows welcome screen. Now maybe the origin moved, and maybe I zoom even farther out. And every time that I do this, I don't want to have to remodel my entire 3D universe relative to like now the astronaut's perspective. And so the question is, what machinery do we need to actually kind of keep track of everything? Right? Did anything actually move? No. But relative to where the camera was, it certainly did. Yep. 
And so the basic observation here is that rarely do we use absolute positions in everyday life, right? We talk about things relative to one another, and that's more or less all that's going on in today's lecture. Okay? This is one of the lectures, unlike I think last week, where it like looks conceptually kind of annoying, I would say this week is conceptually pretty straightforward, but it's just easy to get your bookkeeping wrong. Okay? All right. So we're going to do more linear algebra because that's what we like to do in this class. Um, but we're going to put a little bit of a twist on it, which is to think about the data structures and algorithms that we need to keep track of our linear algebra in a nice, clean way. Okay. So the first uh, thing to do is make sure that we all kind of agree on our terminology here. And the, and the first piece of kind of suspicious terminology we're all used to from algebra class and, and pre-calculus, all that good stuff, let's talk about coordinates. And the first thing to realize is that coordinates are meaningless, right? That um, in order to have coordinates, you need a coordinate system, right? And that requires defining an origin, a basis vectors, and so on. Uh, and, and so really, even though we use these little tuples, like 1, 2, to represent a lot of stuff in linear algebra, in computer graphics, it's going to be really important to distinguish between lots of different objects that all can be notated that way. Right? I mean, we could have points that would be like locations in space, vectors, which are kind of like displacements or velocities, forces, normals. These are kind of like maybe unit length vectors, orientations. Um, and, 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 you know, the issue here is that coordinates are just piles of numbers. They don't tell you which of these objects they are. That makes sense. And so we're going to do linear algebra today, and a lot of it is going to be really boring for many of you guys who took a linear algebra course, but we're going to use slightly more pedantic notation just to make sure that we're always distinguishing between these different objects. And then when we introduce, we're going to do 3D linear algebra with four coordinates. When we have that fourth thing, we're going to see that a really elegant uh, kind of magic happens there. Okay. So, of course, when we talk about coordinates, it's not so clear, but of course, you know, when we talk about points and vectors, it's very clear that these are different objects in, in real life, right? The, the zero vector doesn't really mean any given position. Maybe you talk about it like the origin, but there's no special zero point in the universe. And, 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 and conversely, you know, if I take two points, it really doesn't make sense to add them, right? What is the sum of Boston and New York? Every year I ask this, and I never get a clever punchline, and, and I'm waiting. But someday. Okay. And, uh, you know, similarly, when we, when we write our, our video game, of course, you know, points describe location, vectors describe velocity, and so on. I think you guys get the point. This is, uh, like, enough already. So, we've talked about tuples of numbers. The other thing you guys learned about in linear algebra class is matrices. If you had a fancy linear algebra class, maybe learn about tensors, but we're not going to do that in this class. Uh, and really, matrices also have two purposes. And again, they get muddled together in your linear algebra class, right? The one thing they do is transform stuff. Right? Like if I take every point on a car and I multiply it by rotation matrix, then I get a rotated car. Not all that surprising. On the other hand, I can think of the car sitting, a lot, sitting in the same place using the matrix to move the camera in the opposite direction, right? To change coordinates. And these are completely dual operations. Somehow they look the same. They're both matrix vector multiplies. So what's my point here? My point is that when you take a linear algebra class, you're actually doing a lot of different geometric things. They all just happen to kind of look like matrices and vectors. And, and we're going to try and unglue those a little bit and make sure that, that we think about them intentionally because in a computer graphics system, the way to think about it is kind of like type checking, right? Like when you write C++ code, as many of you guys have now realized in this course, this ain't Python. You know, if I add an integer and, and you know, a string, what, what happens? It just fails, right? It doesn't compile. And that's because it didn't type check, right? And so sim somehow something similar is going on here, right? That, a point and a vector both are tuples of numbers, but there's very rarely a time when you would use one in the same fashion as another, right? And so when the, the, you build a typical computer graphics system, you build it in such a way that your representations sort of tell you what objects you're, you're dealing with and that you don't mix them in like a weird accidental fashion. Okay. So our goals for today, we're going to talk about how to define coordinate systems. Uh, again, many of these are things you've already seen before. We'll talk about how to change coordinate systems, how to transform objects, and the whole time we're going to be super pedantic and boring about the difference between points, vectors, normals, and their coordinates. Incidentally, the first three here, these are geometric objects. <laughs> yeah, so sort of philosophically, they're like things in space. This thing is a pile of numbers, and so we're going to try and separate these things off. Oh, boy. Okay. 
So that's our plan. We're going to work upward in terms of complexity here. So we'll start by just doing basically a linear algebra review. Hopefully many of you guys attended the actual linear algebra review from Helen uh, yesterday? Yesterday? Yesterday. Um, for those of you who didn't, we'll do a little extra today. Then we're going to step sideways from linear algebra and do nonlinear linear algebra, which is uh, we're going to introduce something called homogeneous coordinates. And that's going to allow us to do two things in one. You get a two for one deal. One is that it's going to allow us to apply the most common nonlinear transformation of an object, which is translation. Translation is not linear, right? If I translate something and then scale it, that is not the same as sort of scaling and applying translation, because that translation vector changes length. Yeah. Um, and then in our next lecture, we're going to talk about one particularly funky case which is how to deal with normal vectors. By the way, for those of you uh, who have taken a bunch of math classes and maybe this stuff is review, if you want something that maybe you're not used to thinking about, let's say I have a sphere and I have all of its normals, and I multiply it by a matrix that stretches the sphere out. So I have a normal vector at a point on the sphere. And now I like, take the x-axis and I double it. My question is, what is the normal vector to that scaled up shape? That's going to matter in 3D modeling, right? Because that's how we do shading. Uh, and I'll give you a hint, it's not what you might expect from linear algebra, right? So if I have, here's my sphere, it's the sun, <laughs> so it has normal vectors like that, right? And now I take the x-coordinate, and I multiply it by like 3-ish. That's, that's an ellipse, if you're wondering. What is the normal vector? Well, if I applied the same transformation, right, just like take the x-coordinate and multiply it by 3, what would happen to this normal vector? It would actually kind of point like that. That's not right, right. In fact, if, as I stretch these things out, the normal vector actually becomes more vertical. So something a little bit funky happened. Anyway, I'll let you think about that, and we'll, we'll, we'll go over the math next time. Okay. All right, so remember from uh, our last couple lectures that a vector space, we're going to start easy, is a set of things that can be added and multiplied together. We've now seen a few examples in this class, right, like actual vectors in Euclidean space or uh, functions, like uh, polynomials, that, that those form a vector space. And there's one special element, which is the zero vector, which is like, you know, the lack of a displacement or the lack of force, or something like that. The typical way that we describe a vector space is using a basis. And in our class, when we think about a basis, we're going to think of these as geometric objects that can be scaled and multiplied together. We're not going to think of them like actual piles of numbers. We're just going to carry around symbols that look like this. There's a reason for that. Like, for instance, in the last two lectures, what was our basis? It was like polynomials, right? Like cubic functions. So in that case, we really shouldn't think of it like just like a, a vector of numbers. Um, so really, a basis is just some abstract set of geometric objects that can be scaled and added together. Does that make sense? A little pedantic, I know, but that's OK. OK. So if we have any vector in a vector space with basis bi, then we can always write it in this fashion. Notice we're already introducing a little bit of notation. There's this little arrow on top of your basis vector. In fact, there's an arrow on top of any element of your vector space, because arrow means vector. And the ci's are not going to have uh, uh, arrows on it. Right? These are scalars. These are real numbers. OK. So. If we want to be really fancy about it, let's say that I think of my basis as sitting in a matrix. So I have like B1, B2, B3. These are geometric objects. I'm not going to think of them like coordinates. They're just objects that happen to be in the coordinate columns of a matrix. If I wanted to express this point, I could do so by writing as a matrix vector multiply, right? Where this kind of abstract matrix it, is this object that's holding my basis in it, OK? So in our, and this is probably way more pedantic notation than what your linear algebra class used. Notice what I've done. We now have bold letters, capital letters, and arrow letters. So this is an abstract object, which is a vector. This object is a matrix of vectors. And notice, actually, we are going to use think of this also as a matrix of numbers. That's my bad in the notation here. But we'll come back to that. And then for a bolded thing here is like an actual column of numbers. That makes sense. This is all lifted, by the way, from Stephen Gortler's computer graphics textbook, if you like this kind of thing. He manages to teach an entire graphics class like this. We're going to do one or two lectures, and then like I'll, I'll probably get tired of it and just go back to normal notation, because this is annoying to type on a slide. 
Okay. Right, so when we talk about linear transformations, um, there are a lot of them, right? There's rotation, there's scaling, there's reflection, there's shearing. And in general, what is a linear transformation? Well, it's the thing that inputs a vector in your vector space and outputs another vector. And it satisfies two properties, right? What are, what are they? I got all day. What do, what do linear transformations do? Linear, so like if you translate what's being transformed, I mean if you multiply what's being transformed by a constant, yeah. then it's like... Exactly. So if I apply my linear operator to a constant times a vector, then what I get is a constant times a linear operator applied to the vector. That's absolutely right. And what other property do I need? Yes? Um, you can apply one and then apply the other one. Um, if you need them. Uh, in other words, you can like, you essentially can add the matrices for each transformation. We don't have any matrices. This is a linear transformation. This is an object that takes in a vector and outputs another vector. Preserving distances. It turns out vectors, uh, linear maps don't have to do that. For example, the map that multiplies everything by zero is linear. That takes all the distances to zero. Yes? Yeah, exactly. So one thing I can do is apply the linear transformation to a scaled vector and get a scaled version of the linear transformation. The other thing I can do is apply my linear transformation to the sum of two things. And that is the same as applying sum to the linear transformation. And these two properties, anything where I have a vector space and a function that takes in vectors and output vectors with these two properties, I call linear. Now we usually think of them like matrices, because indeed matrix vector multiply satisfy those, these two things, obviously, yeah? But, um, for example, it could be that this is like acting on functions. So for example, if you want like a fun one to check at home, if I have a function and I map, the, I have the operator that takes a function and gives me back its integral from 0 to 1, you can check that this object is linear in the space of functions. That makes sense, right? Because if I take two functions and add them together and then take their integral, that's the same as taking the integral of the two functions and adding them together. Similarly with scaling. So that's an example of something that isn't a matrix vector multiplier, but is linear. Cool. Okay. I know a lot of this is pedantic in the back of your head if you just keep translating to matrices. Like at the end of the day, you're not going to be wrong, but it is it is important to kind of call this stuff out. Okay. So as you can see here, a transformation uh, which is linear satisfies these two properties. Notice that this implies that L of the zero vector is a zero vector. That's actually a corollary of these two properties. You can get it by taking c equals zero, right? Um, okay, uh, and a pretty typical notation is to think of the action of the map as, the way to read this little symbol here is that L takes V to L of V. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, now let's say that I have a linear combination from a bunch of vectors, and I apply my linear map to it. What do I get? Well, so let's say that V is equal to the sum over i of c i v e, i. For those of you who took my graduate class, we're not going to do something crazy like put the i in a superscript. That's a differential geometry thing. Okay, so if I apply my linear map to v, well, that of course is the same as the sum over i of c i b i. Right? I haven't done anything. Well, what can I do? There's a sum here. So by the second property, I can take this sum out, right? So this is the sum over i of the linear map applied to c i b i. Well, now I have something scaled, so I can take the scale out, and I get the sum over i c i l. Okay. I think we've all seen this in some, some fashion or another. We're just kind of calling out properties that you've already seen and not thought about a whole lot. Okay. So, there's actually something totally profound about this really boring proof that I just wrote down. Which is, initially, L is just a function. It's just some function that satisfies these two conditions. Right? It's just, these, these, it's just two conditions. It doesn't, 
for all we know, there's like some giant space of functions that satisfy these two facts. But what did I just show you? I showed you, if I know the action of L on my basis, then I actually know the action of L anywhere. Do you see that? Because I can write any vector in my space in that basis. And now by knowing the image of each of the BIs, just by com combining with the same weights, I know the action of L on my new vector V. Right? So this is the world's simplest proof, but it's actually kind of, kind of interesting, right? That a linear map is kind of weird in that if I know what it does to a finite number of objects, namely the basis vectors, I'm done. Okay. So we can write this in some kind of funny notation, right? Which is, let's see if we can parse this now. Remember that the left-hand side of the arrow is kind of like the input, and the right-hand side is the output. So the input is a vector, which is written in the basis, b1, b2, b3. Right? That's like what we wrote here. <laughs> right? And so now what does my linear map do? In reality, it just messes with the basis and leaves the weights alone. Kind of slick to write it that way. Okay. Notice, we're just doing stuff you've probably already seen in linear algebra classes, just a different way to do it. And now, if we want, what are we missing? We haven't really seen matrices here. Just row vectors and column vectors. What is L of like B1 and L of B2 and L of B3? These objects are just vectors. And what can I do with vectors when I have a basis? I can write them in that basis, right? So I can take like L of B1 and write it in the B1, B2, B3 basis. See that? It's turtles all the way down. Uh, so what, what happens when we do that? We get a matrix. So in particular, I'm going to write, you know, like M11, M21, and M31 as the coordinates of LB1 in the, the same basis. Does that sentence parse? I know that was a lot of symbols. And if I do the same thing with B2 and B3, well, then I get a matrix worth of values, right? You can do your matrix multiply to kind of determine, make sure I did the right thing. That's describing the linear map, just again on the same basis that I started with. Notice we're just reproducing your linear algebra class. The only difference is that I'm on the left-hand side, keeping something that you probably would normally think of as the identity matrix. I'm just kind of calling it out as a basis. All right, any questions so far? I know this stuff is like hard to crunch on. Yes? That's a great question. The question is basically, what is M? <laughs> right? And the answer is that all these numbers are, are scalars. Right? These are all um, actual real values. The way to see that is that remember that taking L of B1 and writing it in this basis. So this is fancy notation for M11 times B1 plus M21 times B2 plus M31 times B3. Right? Because it's make sure you multiply. Right? You've got to do this gesture a lot. Um, and so, right, so when I multiply that out, this is a linear combination of the B vectors, where the M's are like scalars. Right? And so all this is doing is just combining them into three columns. Yeah. Excellent question. Uh, any others? Okay, this is like the kind of thing where there's a lot of symbols, but you'll sit home for like 15 minutes and then kind of chew on it a bit and it won't be too bad. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that I can kind of understand my linear map. So if B is my basis, right, then my linear map is kind of taking my coordinates and pre-multiplying them by that matrix M. And so here, this B that's hanging out on the left-hand side is usually implicit in your, your linear algebra class, right? That's your basis. And typically, you think about it like just the identity matrix, the vectors, so we just don't bother writing them down. Yep. Okay. And notice that there's kind of two ways to parenthesize this expression, right? I could parenthesize it on the left side or the right side. Like I can think of it as B times M times C or B times M times C, <laughs> right? And those correspond to exactly those two dual pictures that we use to describe linear transformations, right? That either it's a change of basis, that's like grouping it on the left-hand side and the coordinates stay the same, or it's like leaving the bases alone and changing the coordinates, like rotating, you know, are you rotating your car or are you rotating your camera the opposite direction? It's just a question of how you parenthesize. Okay. This is great because this like totally appeals to all of my dyslexia, getting these things backward. Okay. So the question is like, so what? So I, I mean, there are many different fast algorithms for like matrix vector multiply, matrix 
Make sure to multiply all that kind of stuff. It is built into your hardware. Your graphics card is hella good at multiplying matrices. That is a job in life. I guess now they have two jobs, right? One is that and the other is like deep networks. But, but that aside, your, your, your graphics card is really good at applying transformations because that is what happens a million times a second on your, on your GPU. Okay? And so this sort of formulation is actually mostly for us to be thinking about it rather than for the computer. But, but the reality is even if we have to write our geometry code in a way that's a little bit of bookkeeping so that we don't go crazy, that's actually okay because our, our hardware can handle it. And so the really critical thing in graphics is to keep your change of basis correct because pretty soon we're going to have many. We're going to have like the coordinate system of your arm relative to your body, the coordinate system of your car relative to you know this, that, relative to this, the other thing. And we're going to need to keep track of it really carefully. Now, every year I have a million of you, 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 you people in my office hours with all kinds of crazy bugs. By the way, the bugs in this class are funny. Like, this week I'm noticing a lot of segmentation faults. That'll go away as you get used to C++. And then what it'll get replaced with are like, you know, I tried to move my car this way and instead it moved that way and multiplied by seven kind of thing. Um, and, and this is, you're going to see a lot of that in this, this next assignment. So the next assignment, you're going to implement lots of like relative hierarchical transformations. You'll have like a 3D character with arms and legs and bones and everything will be in terms of everything else. You, you know, like your hand in terms of your arm, in terms of your upper arm, in terms of your body. You have to compose those the correct way. And then to make your life worse, we're going to have you implement skinning. So that's like how this triangle mesh that's sitting on top deforms in response to these bones moving. But the triangle mesh is just going to be in world coordinates. It's not relative to these bones. So you're going to have to like compose two of these things. Um, so anyway, my advice to you is to just keep remembering whether you should be applying a matrix or its inverse and to keep track of what coordinate system you're in. And the way that I like to think about matrices from a high level they're kind of like functions, like there are functions, or linear functions, right? So in other words, like a matrix takes in an input and then outputs a vector, which is like that matrix times that vector. I know this is pedantic, but literally every time I talk about this stuff, that's how we're going to do it. And I think it makes a lot of sense because, for instance, I'm going to be talking about like, well, this matrix takes me from the car coordinate system to the world coordinate system. So, you know, if I'm really careful in my code to just kind of remember where I am, it's going to be a lot easier. Than just guessing, like, should this be matrix, it's inverse, or it's transpose, or it's inverse transpose. Okay, I, I think I've harped on this enough. Of course, um, there are many different ways to do change of basis, right? So if I have two different bases for the same space A and B, kind of like we already saw, I can take one basis and write it in terms of the other. This is applying the fact that by definition of a basis, right, a, a basis is a thing that can express any vector in your vector space, right? Um, and so if I take you know, all the A vectors and write them in terms of the B vectors using a matrix M, then I can note that, notate that you know, this way, that A equals B times M. Or if I want to do change basis the other way, then it's A times M, for a, M inverse equals B. A lot of symbols, but all pretty straightforward stuff. It's the kind of stuff that like, when you're doing it, get out a piece of scratch paper and just work through it. OK. So let's say that. We have those two relationships on the top of the slide here. And now I give you a vector in the B basis. So my vector V is equal to B times C. And I'd like to write it in the A basis. How can I do it? Well, at the end of the day, I'm going to know I need that A matrix multiplied by some coordinates, right? So let's hack it a little bit. So I have my vector V. He's equal to B times C. I'm sorry, it's hard to write a bold vec letter here. Hopefully you'll follow. I can see it's kind of, kind of bold. Okay. And I know that I want that to be A times something, right? The coordinates in the A space. Well, one thing I can do is really boring. I can do A times A inverse times B times C. <laughs> That's certainly equal to B times C. Right? It didn't do anything. And what happens if I group it this way? <laughs> well, now I have the coordinates in the A basis. So that's the kind of like boring trick that we'll do a lot of in this class, right? Um, yeah. Uh, right. I guess I... Oh, no, I already got it. I was already stupid. Um, a is equal to BM. I already messed up my, my, my pedantic notation. I apologize. 
I apologize, I apologize. A and B, remember, are the matrices that are keeping track of like the abstract vectors. And then M is the thing with the coordinates in it, like the numbers. So if you really want to be careful about it, you would do basically the same trick here, but substituted in M, right? So, so notice that I wrote A equals BM, A M inverse equals B. These two are pretty clear relationships. So if I have V equals BC, I have an expression for B, which is A times M inverse. And that's how I got this new expression. This is the same trick. It's just being careful. Yes? When working with this, would we have like matrix A, B, and M? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that imply like M inverse equal to A inverse? Right, so this is my bad. This is really not a valid expression because we're, in this class, we're thinking of A as just like a pile of vectors in an abstract space, whereas M is containing coordinates. This is a totally pedantic point. That is like one of these things that students will agree with as long as their lecture gets it right. The second we get it wrong, we confuse everybody in the room, which I think I just managed to do. Um, so let's, let's stick with what's on the screen here. Because again, remember that A is a basis matrix. It's like, and this is why I don't love this notation, but it's what MIT wants me to use. Um, it's a matrix whose columns are just like these abstract vectors in the space. Similarly for B. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about inverses because these aren't inverses, they're like piles of abstract objects. But remember that M is this matrix that actually contains coordinates in it, right, defined using these kinds of relationships. So that's the thing I can invert. I'm sorry, you can see I already screwed it up. So what is the likelihood that this will be on your exam? Zero. Um, right, so what, what matters in this, this course is going to be just reasoning through how to have, construct the right matrix to take you from one space to the other this kind of goofy notation where you keep your basis on the left-hand side to be really careful about it is a little, little less important. That said, I shouldn't have gotten it wrong. That's my bad. Okay. So, we've talked about linear transformations, and in computer graphics, there are many. What is the obvious missing transformation here? It's translation, right? If I have a car and I want it to move forward, I need to have some means of, of having the car change its coordinates in the forward direction. The reason we haven't done that yet is because we've only talked about vectors. We haven't talked about points, right? And translation is an operation that applies to points, not to vectors, okay? And notice that translation really isn't linear, right? So if I have the function f of p that takes p and translates by a vector t, right? It's a simple function, but it's not a linear one, right? Because if I put in f of ap, right, like I scale it by a scalar here, well, that's a p plus t, but if it were linear, it would be a p plus a t. Can you see that? So it's almost linear, but not quite. Okay. So that leads us to our next point, which is good. I'm out of the, the water with this goofy notation, which is uh, dealing with points rather than vectors. And where things are confusing is, of course, uh, they both have coordinates, right? Um, right, so a point is a location. And now we can think about all the kind of crazy type checking stuff that you probably did in your head but weren't very careful with in linear algebra class, right? Like you can add two vectors together, that makes sense. It's like two different displacements. You can add a vector to a point, but you can't add points to each other and you can't scale points. Okay. So we had a vector space for a space of vectors. Does anybody know what is the name of a space of, of points? No, that would be a reasonable name, but uh, rather than being a point space, uh, we call it an affine space. Right? You might remember this from linear algebra class, that like an affine transformation allows you to translate and scale, for example. And we're going to denote members of an affine space using tildes. <laughs> Again, I'm going to get it wrong, so just feel free to catch me at any point like you guys did before. Sorry, like you guys did before. Okay, so... We'll think of points as things with tils on it, vectors as things with arrow on them, coordinates as bolded objects, matrices as capital letters, and then realizing that matrices are a tiny bit overloaded because the letter M kind of had numbers in it, and the letters A and B had vectors. I apologize. Okay. This is like really crazy notation for pretty simple stuff. Okay. So, uh, right. If we want to think about points, one way to do it is to choose an origin in your space, like just choose some fixed point in your space, and then write everything else in your space as a displacement from that fixed point. And now hopefully this notation makes some sense on the screen, right? So you have an origin plus a linear combination of vectors because they are displacements from the origin. Does that make sense? 
It's just the, this first equal sign here. Be, pay close attention to the squiggle and the arrow. <laughs> so there's a single point plus some, some displacements. Yes? Ah, that's a good question. So this is the sum of vectors. So the thing that comes out of the sum is a vector. A vector plus a point is another point, right? Because you're displacing from the origin. Great question. Any others? Well, I can't see you anyway because of the projector. Okay. Um, if we want to take the notation that we had before and extend it, one way we can do that is we can take our basis and then we're going to glue onto it one additional object, which is your origin. And if we just want to read off this expression we have on the left, using a matrix vector multiply, notice this is C1 times B1 plus C2 times B2 plus C3 times B3 plus 1 times the origin. And we're going to allow ourselves to do one thing, which is to take points and multiply them by 1. We're not going to allow ourselves to multiply points by any other number. Okay? So this is kind of cute. So if you want to notate a point, notice what I just sneakily did. We used to be in 3D. We're still in 3D. But we kind of added a fourth coordinate, which is a 1. This is the first time that we're going to see that. This is just a dummy for now. This is a 1 that we carry around to remind ourselves that this is a point. Okay? Now let's stare at this notation. Yes? So just to like reiterate, P is the point that we're representing. Yes. O is the origin, and then the, the sum of all those other things is like the vector from the origin to the point. Exactly. This is totally pedantic notation, right? And like normally the origin you think of is like zero zero zero, so you just slice it out. Yes. The origin not have four coordinates. The origin does have four coordinates. What would they be? Zero 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 one. Yeah. Okay. So the b vectors now are also four coordinates. That's a good question. So I haven't told you how to write down vectors in this notation yet. So, what do we know? If I take two points and I subtract them, what should I get? It's a displacement, right? What is a displacement? Is it a point or a vector? Vector. A vector. Notice if I have something, 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 one, and another is something else, something else, something else, one, and I subtract them, what's going to be the fourth coordinate? So how am I going to represent vectors? Things where the fourth coordinate is zero. Is this sneaky or what? Because now what happens when I add together two vectors? What is the fourth coordinate? Zero, right? Because the fourth coordinate is zero of two vectors. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> I'm speaking of miss. <laughs> if I add a vector and a point, <laughs> what is it? Is there still a one in that last coordinate, right? Zero plus one. If I add a point and a point, that's two, and that's against the rules. <laughs> and we can see that because we got a two, and we don't know what to, we don't know how to deal with two. We only know how to deal with zeros and ones. If I average two points, I take the midpoint. So I take two points, add them together, and divide by two. That does make sense. What do I get? Another point. Yeah, this is completely self-consistent. that nice or what? So we call these homogeneous coordinates. And it really does maintain all of this kind of cute notational stuff we had before, right? Like point minus point gives you vector, point plus vector equals point, all that good stuff. Cool. Okay. So, just like we had, you know, a basis before, the analog of a basis in the affine world is only called a frame, and that's an origin plus a basis, right? Because now I need some corner point and displacements from that corner point to express any point in my affine space. Um, and so, you know, a frame would be like this point O, and then all the basis vectors B. Okay, there's just a lot of vocabulary terms here. Okay. So here's our recap so far. Vectors can be written in bases. These bases consist of vectors. Points in an affine space can be written in a frame. And we can think of them like an origin plus some displacement in a, a vector space basis. OK. And now, for our big punchline for the day, which is like, you know, what, probably ninth grade math, we can talk about translation, right? So in particular, we can think of translation as almost a linear operation. <laughs> now, how would I do that? So let's say that I wanted to take a point and translate it by a vector. Well, I can actually think about it in a 4 by 4 matrix case, and that's what we're going to try and construct now. Okay, so 
to speak generally first, um, an affine transformation um, is just going to be anything that you know, just looks like what we had before, but now we're going to allow a matrix of 0, 0, 0, 1 in the end here. And now let's, uh, let's do a couple examples um, uh, in our, our thing here. I don't know why I have a copy of that slide there. Okay, so we know how to translate our vector. So let's say that I had... Um, Right, so now let's say that I have a, 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 a transformation just of my vector space, and I just glue 0, 0, 0, 1 onto the end of my matrix. What happens when I transform this thing by a, vec uh, by a point, rather? Notice it leaves the 1 alone, and it just messes with this stuff here, which makes a lot of sense. Right, so really this is just fancy notation for a change of basis in the basis part of your space, and leaving the point alone. But now we can do one additional thing, which is let's say I want to represent a translation function, right? So this is a thing that takes in a point P and now points a point P plus T. Does that make sense? That's translation. I claim we can write this, of course, using a matrix relationship. So remember, it's turtles all the way down. I'm going to take my translation vector. That's a vector. So I can write it in my vector basis as a combination of B1, B2, and B3. Right? Here are the weights. Okay, so now, if I want to think about translation, here's how I can do it. <laughs> so let's actually do this matrix vector multiply for fun. I know it's everybody's idea of fun. Um, sorry. So, I have a big, I'm going to omit the thing on the left hand side for now. So we have 1, 0, 0, M, 1, 4. By the way, this stands for row 1, column 4. Right, um, 0, 1, 0, 2, 4, 0, 0, 1, and 3, 4, and then 0, 0, 0, 1. And first of all, let's say that I multiply it by a, a point. There's going to be something really magical that happens here. This is so cool. C2, C1, C2, C3, it's a point, so there's a 1 here. What do I get? Let's do it. So it's 1 times C1 plus 0 plus 0 plus M14. Yeah? I get C1 like that. Similarly, I get C2 plus M24, C3 plus M34. Then what do I get for the fourth coordinate? 1. So what did I do? I took a point with coordinates C1, C2, C3, and I translated it. Right, I added to it these values here. So I was able to write translation as a matrix vector multiply by adding that fourth coordinate. Does that make sense? Similarly, let's say that I took this matrix, I'm not going to write it again because I'm lazy, and I have C1, C2, C3, 0. So now it's a vector. What do I get? Please don't make me write that matrix again. Just think of taking this matrix, copy-pasting it there. Exactly. If you do your major multiply, you'll get that. And why is that? Does translation do anything to vectors? No, it only operates on points. So all of that is hiding inside of this nice major vector multiply. Sneaky, huh? Okay. Right, so a full affine expression uh, is this whole giant matrix here. Without loss of generality, we're always going to have the last row be 0, 0, 0, 1 for now. Um, and the nice thing is that this encapsulates a change of basis or a linear operation on your basis, whichever way you like to think about it, and a translation component all in one giant matrix. Okay. Right, and I guess we've already talked about this. I should move it back. Um, okay. Right, and then the key observation here is that if I put a vector into this 4 by 4 matrix multiply, it basically just ignores the fourth column. So it's just like the notation we had before, just taking the upper 3 by 3 part of the matrix. Right? So this is just a way to generalize the notation we had before. All right, now we're done with the painful bookkeeping part. Now we can do one level higher. So now we're going to think about frames and hierarchical modeling. In other words, we have all the language we need to describe all the different, you know, translations, rotations, everything from one, you know, from the camera to the car to the human and so on. 
and we got to compose all these objects together. And this is where things get kind of hairy, right? So like, for instance, if I want to rotate the wheel of a moving car, you know, and then I have to animate the car from a static camera position, notice that the motion of the wheel is actually pretty crazy. It's like a corkscrew. <laughs> but of course, in the coordinate system of the wheel, it's not so crazy. It's just, it's just rotating about its, its center point, right? And so the question is, how do we get that crazy corkscrew motion without like excruciating pain on the programmer's part? Yeah. Um, and the answer is by doing all kinds of annoying bookkeeping that looks something like this. Like, I have a big chain of matrix multiplies that are going to take me from one system to another, to another, to another. And then I can apply the transformation that I want. And then I've got to undo them all. Does this remind you guys of any data structure you might have seen in your algorithms class? Kind of like a stack. Right? I'm going to like move down the stack until I'm in like some particular coordinate system. You know, do my transformation. Then I'm going to move back up the stack and undo everything by like multiplying by the inverses. Yeah? And so that's the kind of thing we have to do. So a very typical thing to do if I want to like, you know, I'm in the car coordinate system and I want to transform the world coordinate system for some reason. Right? Then what do I have to do? Well, if I think of A as going from car to world and S as going from world to transform world, and I want to know the effect of S in the car coordinate system. What do I have to do? Well, first I apply A to go to the world coordinate system. Then I can apply my S. Now I've got to go back to the car coordinate system and so on. See, so that's the kind of reasoning that we're going to have to do a lot of in, in computer graphics. In fact, whoa, uh, in OpenGL 1.0, there's even a built-in data structure that was a stack on your graphics card that would maintain all of this stuff. Uh, the kind of interesting thing that's happened since then is it's actually been deprecated. OpenGL no longer has this transformation stack built in because they sort of think of it as your problem. <laughs> that's a separate, a separate issue. Okay. There are a couple things worth noting. First of all, how do we combine transformations? It's just by matrix multiply, right? Remember, there are two things I could do. I could like transform a point and then apply another transform of a point. Or I could parenthesize the other way around and like multiply all the matrices together and then apply that thing to the point that's the same. Right? So if I want to scale and then translate, so here's a scaling matrix. Notice that it doesn't translate. There's 0, 0, 1 on the right-hand side. And there's scaling factors here. And then I could translate by 3, 1. If I compose these things together, I get some other matrix, which is terribly surprising. Cool so far? Cool! enthusiasm in this room is not high enough to kind of work on it. <laughs> but there's a little bit of a gotcha. Can I scale and then translate? Or translate and then scale? Are those the same operation? No. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. Right? So uh, here's an illustration of what this looks like. So here I scaled and then I translated. There's the box that I got. Here I translated and then I scaled. And notice like the bottom left coordinate is different. And this is where all of the headache in graphics programming lives right here. It's because if you multiply on the wrong side of your matrix, you're like, all hell is going to break loose. Guaranteed. Okay. And so when you, when you do your composition, you have to be extremely careful that every time you use the word, and then, do you know this, this scene from Dude, Where's My Car? Never mind. Um, if you do something, and then you do something else, where is that second one going to appear in this chain of matrices? On the left, I know in a red brain we talk about it as happening after I do this and then that, but that in this case it goes right to left. Okay? Cool. All right. You guys all nod now, and I'm going to see you in my office with bugs. It doesn't matter every single time. Yes, Darius. Does this mean that we can only scale when we're blocking origin? Can we only scale when we're on the origin? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, Right, so one thing to double check is if you took a point that isn't the origin, so like it has coordinates with a one, then the scaling will it'll apply to these coordinates, that's exactly what it should do, right? It'll, this is just like doubling the size of your car, which is the same as doubling the displacement from the origin, but it'll leave that one alone. Yeah, so when we talk about scaling, the number that you can't scale is the last row. Right? So for instance, notice in our scaling matrix, that's a one here. Yeah, great question. Any others? All right, so now um, we're going to broaden ever so slightly. So we keep kind of taking bigger and bigger classes of geometric objects. We started with vectors. We introduced points by kind of introducing a fourth coordinate. 
and we have this really slick notation, this fourth coordinate is going to turn out to be super valuable for two things. One is translation, the other is for coping with the camera projection. Right? Because your camera is a super nonlinear object, right? When you look at train tracks on your computer screen, they like look like they're going into each other on the screen. But that's really clearly not a linear transformation, right? Because linear would keep parallel lines parallel, right? And so something nonlinear happened. The question is, what is it? And essentially, it's going to turn out that these homogeneous coordinates will be extremely valuable for that particular case. So let's see how. So in general, that fourth coordinate, again, is, is, is usual for perspective projection. We'll call it homogeneous. And in general, for the plane, in 3D, we'll have a Z here in the obvious place where you think it should go. We'll say that planar homogeneous coordinates have three coordinates. Homogeneous coordinates in 3D have how many coordinates? Four. Four, thank you. And the way we're going to view it is that all objects, we're going to make an equivalence relationship, which is that we're going to consider these two objects to be the same, x, y, and w, and c, x, c, y, c, w. Okay? For any c that is non-zero. This is going to be important because this is what's going to allow us to separate vectors from uh, points. Right? So in particular, now it's going to be okay if we have a homogeneous coordinate that's like 2, we know how to cope with. This is just a definition, by the way. Right? So we're going to think of x and y as points on the plane, and w is just like a convenient object we're going to keep around. Okay. So let's do a little bit of an exercise to make sure you guys understand. Um, Let's say that I have the point x, y in inhomogeneous coordinates, which is a fancy word for coordinates of a, of a point in the plane. Can you guys give me the homogeneous coordinates of the point x, comma, y? It's not a trick question. 2x, 2y, not quite. So the homogeneous, first of all, in homogeneous coordinates, how many coordinates should the plane have? Three. Yes? Exactly. Notice I'm using the semicolon to separate off like the geometry part from the convenience part. All right, now Darius, you have the right idea. Give me a different coordinates for the same point. 2x, 2y, 2. 2x, 2y, 2. Right? These are considered equivalent in this space. Yes? No. <laughs> no. Uh, because for all non-zero c. Sure. Negative what? Exactly. Negative x, negative y, negative 1. We're going to consider all of these points to be the same in homogeneous space. Why is this going to be convenient? Because in perspective projection, we're going to want to divide by z when we go from 3D to 2D. And so we're going to kind of stick the z coordinate there, and implicitly we'll divide by z. Kind of sneaky. Yes? Yeah, because it's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be anything. Yep. Yes? Because we define them to be that way. Yeah. This is just the definition of the homogeneous plane. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Cool. Okay. And similarly, if we want to convert from points in homogeneous coordinates to just classical coordinates, what would be the point 1, 5, 1 in the plane? 1, 5. How about 12 minus 6, 3? 4, negative 2. He's got it, this one. Yeah. And I'll let you do the third one at home. Yes? Because in homogeneous coordinate, I have to give you the third one. So homogeneous coordinates means that I gave you three numbers to represent a point. Oh, we can't just choose three. That would be a different point than putting a one there. Oh, yeah, exactly. In fact, if you did uh, put a one there, yeah, then it would be 12 minus six. If you put a three there, that would be kind of like four, negative two, one, right? Yeah, but not the same point. Yeah. Yes? So, like, let's say that we have the one, five, semicolon, one, one. We want to make, like, squish closer to the origin or something. We can just put a bigger number instead of one. Yes, that's exactly right. I have two different ways to squash a point toward the origin. I can either scale these coordinates down, or I can scale this number up, because I'm going to divide out by it later. 
That's absolutely right. And that's what's going to be super convenient for our camera projection. Because what we're going to do, camera projection is not going to be linear. There's going to be a divide in there, because I'm going to divide by Z. But I can make it look linear by sticking it in this coordinate here. Yeah. These are all great questions. Any, any others? Okay. So. Right, we've already done this in our, our discussion. The only difference now is that we're going to allow there to be things that are non zero or one in that last coordinate. By the way, notice that this did accidentally distinguish vectors from points. Now, a, a point is something where the, third, the, the last coordinate is non-zero rather than just one. And a vector is something where the last coordinate is zero. And because the equivalence requires the scaling factor to be non-zero, those two don't get confused with each other. There's only one point in homogeneous space which really doesn't make a ton of sense. Well, that's not true, actually. I'll, I'll take that back. Yeah, this is fine. Okay. Um, yes? So, so, are you saying that, like, if, if I were to represent a vector in coordinates, it would have, like, a zero and That's right. But what does that not allow me to do? Let's think about that for a second. So, remember that in homogeneous space, I can scale and nothing changes. So, if I take a vector and I just scale it, does anything change? No, right? Because the third coordinate is still zero. So you can't quite represent a vector in, in, in this uh, space. All you can represent is a direction. Yeah. In fact, here's a, a nice picture of what that looks like. So let's say I have the origin, and now I displace towards some point, and I just keep taking that point farther and farther and farther out to infinity. What's going to happen? That's like scaling with C, which is a large number. Or equivalently, that's like x comma y comma 1 over c. So when c goes to infinity, so I end up converting points to vectors. So there's something kind of philosophical there. Um, and that's because really it's all it's capturing is a direction. It's, it's not capturing the length. Yeah. By the way, if you're a math student and you want something kind of crazy to think about, uh, if you've ever taken a topology class, you should think about what the topology is of the subject. But that's for another day. Okay. So why do we need homogeneous coordinates? Well, this picture almost gives it away, which is that like, if I want to draw a fish and he's 10 feet away from the camera, right, then the farther away I move my camera, the smaller the fish looks. And that scaling factor is exactly distance. Right? And so if we want to do perspective, so like here's the world's simplest perspective. Right? So there's just depth and the x-coordinate. Right? What can I do? Well, from the camera's perspective, these two points look the same because they're on the same line out of the camera, right? Here's x comma z, so z is distance from camera, and x is maybe displacement from the middle line here. That makes sense? So right here is the plane that's distance 1 from the camera. So here's a point that's x over z comma 1. Here's another one which is distance z away, and with x coordinate x. And from the camera's perspective, these two are the same thing, right? Because anything along this line is the same point on the computer screen, which is just this line here. That makes sense? Okay. So, what does that mean? That means that the, the projected kind of camera point here is x over z comma 1 comma 1. That's nonlinear, right? Because my input was x comma z, my output was a fraction. That's not a linear thing. But what can I do in homogeneous coordinates that I can't do in classical linear algebra? I can scale. In particular, I can scale by z. So in fact, the coordinates of the point on the camera screen, I can write it in a different fashion, which is x comma z comma z. And now this kind of looks like a linear transformation. Sneaky. A lot of sneaky stuff that goes on here. So in other words, if I want to think of the, the, the projection matrix for perspective, what can I do? I have my point x comma z comma 1. I want to get rid of that 1 and replace it with a z. Right? And this is the matrix that does that. See, it zeroes out the one, and it takes a copy of the second coordinate and puts it in the third one. And this is the camera projection. Does that make sense to everybody? So a really kind of funny thing happened, which is camera projection is not a linear operation. There's no universe in which projection onto a two-dimensional screen is linear. But it is linear in homogeneous coordinates. So it's not linear in your, your kind of usual coordinates. By the way, is this the only matrix that does that camera projection? Let's, let's see if I can get you guys all confused by the time I'm done. That's my goal. What if I took two times this entire matrix? 
what would I get? I get 2x, 2z, 2z, which is the same point. So this is actually not a unique matrix that does this camera transformation. Yes? Exactly. Yeah. All right. So the, the, the more kind of generic version of the story is that if I want to project stuff onto the screen, right, abstractly, I can th think of my computer screen as like a little rectangle that's one unit away from my eye. And if I do that, then to get the coordinates of a point in my screen, right, I have x, y, z, what do I have to do? I have to take x and y and divide them by z. Right? And the way that I can do that in homogeneous coordinates is just by replacing that 1 in the third coordinate with a z. Okay. And so that's the, the basic point here. The showpiece of this kind of math is perspective. That you can now incorporate perspective projection into your kind of linear algebra language. Right? So now I can do things like camera transformation using 4x4 four four linear algebra. Right? I can compose these things together. That's perfectly fine. Any questions so far? This is the kind of thing that I think is a little hard to digest in a lecture, but you should go home and really think about like, what's going on here. Like, in particular, write down the matrix for translation and write down the matrix for the camera projection with like, your eye sitting at the origin and pointing down the z-axis or something. Like, just, you can like, cook up these exercises pretty easily. Right? Um, there are all kinds of fun applications of this. One of the famous ones in the computer graphics world is something called photo tourism. Um, this is kind of a fun one where like, if, if you're looking for a good exercise for using camera transformations in all kinds of crazy ways. You should dig through this old research paper. So what they do is they say, like, you know, maybe I go to some really popular spot in Rome, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so many people have taken photos of the Colosseum that I basically have it from every angle, and I want to now co-register all these photos into one coordinate system, and then I can do, like, some kind of walk around of the 3D scene, even though I only have a finite set of photographs. It's kind of cool that you can do that. So what do they do? They extract a few points in common between every pair of photos, and they estimate a relative camera motion from one photo into the other photo. And now their goal in life is to take all these random motions, all these relative motions, and put them all in one coordinate system. So as you can imagine, all the math that's behind the scenes for a tool like this uh, is extremely complicated, but it's really just a big pile of camera transformations all composed together. Right. Uh, and so this is a computer vision problem. It's called structure from motion. Uh, many of you have probably seen it. Here the motion is kind of funny. It's kind of like the motion of the camera from one post to another. Let's see what this looks like. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's also a little bit dated. Right, so they choose some popular spot in Rome. They download all the photographs of it. And then your instructor gets bored and zooms forward a little bit. Right, and this is what you get, which is now you can see where all of the cameras are in one coordinate system. And this gives you kind of a cool way to, you know, go through your big collection of photographs. But notice that they did something kind of cool here is they didn't try to reconstruct the 3D geometry of the scene. They just used the camera position to kind of like give you some reasonable way to navigate the photographs that you have around. And then all that's going on here is they're animating the camera pose and then just kind of linearly interpolating the photograph from one to the other. And what comes out is actually a pretty plausible 3D effect, which is pretty surprising. Anyway, I think in the time, um, people thought this was going to be the way that everybody navigates their photo albums. It turns out, to make this work, you really have to have a ton of photographs. But it is a pretty cool concept, and, and one that I think is a little neglected. There's also some follow-up work a couple years later at SIGGRAPH where they do the same thing, but like everybody is standing in a crowd filming something on their iPhone. Now you want to like explore the video scene, so now you can move the camera and the video is kind of happening from multiple perspectives at the same time. And it's pretty cool that you can do this kind of stuff. But really behind the scenes of this stuff, you guys now have all the language you need to understand it. It's essentially just one giant camera motion kind of a problem. Right? Okay, so with that, that's all we have for the day. Uh, when you guys get home, you should review the contents of this lecture. I know there's a lot of bookkeeping and you, I, even your instructor gets himself confused. But essentially, it's just a question of remembering what coordinate system you are in at any given time. Don't forget, you have a homework due tomorrow. There are late days in this class that you can use, but... Oh, it's not due tomorrow. It was due tomorrow. <laughs> now it's due on Friday. And uh, I was like, why do they look sad all of a sudden? Um, so uh, there will be extra office hours tomorrow, late in the day, in addition to the ones at the normal time. Good luck.